Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Adrian Monk. I'm Managing Director of Communications and Social Engagement here at the World Economic Forum. It's my great pleasure to introduce the second of our co-chairs press conferences uh, this afternoon with four fantastic co-chairs. We have uh, Philippe Luerou of the International Finance Corporation, uh, Minister Ursula von der Leyen, Defence Minister of the Federal Republic of Germany, Minister Burger Brende of Norway, and Khalid Biari of Saudi Telecom. We're going to hear from each of them about their hopes and aspirations for this uh, meeting. They've already participated in sessions uh, this morning, and uh, they have a tight schedule of sessions to go to, so we're going to have to draw things to a close at 55 minutes past the hour. And my apologies to all of you for our late running this morning, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start with Philippe and just ask him about his hopes for this meeting and also about the startups that the International Finance Corporation has brought uh, to this uh, Jordan event. Philippe. Thank you very much. And uh, as I said before, we are extremely happy to be associated with this initiative during the WEF uh, this year to, uh, to bring 100 uh, startups, all young, and uh, including a very good share of uh, women CEOs in these startups. I mean, this is something that we felt very strongly about to show that one of the key issues in the region is youth and youth unemployment. That the private sector is the solution to uh, economic development and social integration. Now, to encourage these uh, startups, we need to create the condition for them to prosper, to grow, and to be successful. And that we can do through finance. Access to finance has always been an issue in the region. And IFC role is to try to facilitate that, and we're doing it. We need incubators and accelerators so that when you're a young 25-year-old with a great idea, you'll have the support system. And it's not only money. It's, uh, it's peer, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. There are many different aspects. Then having access to venture capital, very important. It's, that's where you take the risk on the, on the finance. But then that's not, that's not finished. Then you need to have access to the more normal banking and equity. So that's kind of what we call the ecosystem, if you want. But that's a stricto sensu uh, ecosystem. But when I discuss to these entrepreneurs, they talk also about the larger system. But I, we can say it's also an ecosystem, infrastructure, and different countries vary, obviously. Good policies, good regulations to limit the, the burden. Less rest step is better for startups. Encouraging rather than being discouraged because you have a lot of talent in the region. And don't take my word for it. Go outside, talk to them. It's quite amazing. A lot of creativity, a lot of talent. They have to stay in the region and employ young people in the region because one of the issues, if the ecosystem is not supportive, they will not lose their talent, but they may go somewhere else because they, will, they would like to be successful and they may go out. And this is very critical. So it's a big hope, but very important in hope is to make sure that the hope translates into success in the, in the next few years. Thank you very much. And Mr. Van der Leyen, one of the uh, factors underlying that uh, the enabling environment for talent is, is obviously security and stability in the region. Can you speak a little to that? Yes, thank you. I can pick up at uh, Philip's words. Um, if Philip is talking about an ecosystem, describing the ecosystem, it has to have a frame, which is the frame of security and stability. Uh, what I want to emphasize is at this conference is unique that we have the prerequisites that are necessary uh, for frame and ecosystem <coughs> because, of course, I know as a Minister of Defense um, what is necessary to provide security and stability, mainly through enabling local forces for the local empowerment. But you'll never have long-lasting sustainable uh, security and stability if there is not economic development and if there is not um, good governance, which is policies. And so those three together are completely linked. One cannot live or exist without the other. A second part I want to focus on is uh, the digitalization you mentioned and women. It's a huge opportunity for women 
because you can work completely independent of physical location and time. And you do not need a lot of investment. What you need is a brain and an idea and an internet access. That's it. Uh, you can work from everywhere at any time in whatever condition you are. And uh, you're not confronted with unconscious biases. Um, so the perfect environment for uh, female entrepreneurship and innovation. And perhaps the third point, we will have a discussion here at this uh, conference too on, of course, the cyber and information room. And we will debate how we can foster and bring forward our positive narrative of an open society, of uh, inclusiveness, uh, in competition to and fighting the false narratives that are projected by either Daesh and other extremist groups, which are narratives of hatred and division, also by right-wing movements in Europe, for example, who feed each other what hatred is concerned. So from this conference, too, should go out a strong signal and a strong narrative about inclusiveness, about an open society. Thank you. And uh, Minister Brenda, Norway has uh, a great history of engagement in the political and peace processes here in, in the region, but also perhaps uh, now with its sovereign wealth fund as a, a source of investment for some of these initiatives that uh, Philippe is bringing to this forum. Perhaps you could tell us more. You can count on Norway when it comes to the inform a very important transformation that this region has to uh, undergo, uh, especially is a big challenge uh, with the youth uh, bulge. More than 50% of the population in many countries in Maghreb and uh, also in the whole MENA region are under the age of 25. Just imagine among amount of jobs, skills, and also education that is needed. That's why Norway has doubled uh, our ODA um, in the field of education during the last three years. Also in the humanitarian field, we need to do more on education. On average, on the global humanitarian relief, only two to three percent of it goes to education. For Norway, uh, I will now uh, make clear that at least 20 percent of our humanitarian support to this region, Syria, Iraq, etc., will be allocated to education to create opportunities for the children and the adolescents. And we still need a lot of additional funding. There are still 200,000 <coughs> children in Lebanon that are of Syrian origin that are not attending school. Uh, this is totally unacceptable and it shows that we are still faced with big challenges in this region. Another initiative that is very important for us is that we also have to look at the challenges here in Jordan and in Lebanon when they are taking such a big responsibility for refugees. Still, a lot of actors are saying, oh, these are lower middle income countries, so they're not eligible for, for example, all the funding of the World Bank and other uh, institutions. They take a huge asymmetric huge asymmetric responsibility when it comes to refugees. So we would like to push also that more funding would be available for Lebanon and Jordan. We will also walk the talk when it comes to no supporting the countries in transition uh, in Maghreb. I'm announcing that we will open an embassy in Tunisia next year and we will double our support, for example, to Tunisia also on the ODA side. This is a democracy that is very fragile, and if we don't support no, the cost of inaction is a lot higher than action. And we will also support work to establish a free trade arrangement in uh, Maghreb. If that was so, we would see an increase the first year of 3% in the GDP. So this is a long hanging fruit, where I think the leaders in Maghreb have to take responsibility for delivering. Thank you very much. And uh, Halim Biari, some of these startups that we're seeing here are very reliant on digital technology and, and one thing that underpins that is infrastructure. Uh, Saudi Telecom is obviously involved in helping to upgrade and support 
infrastructure in the region. Can you talk a little bit more about, about the needs the region has and how it can be addressed? Um, on that, three quick messages. One is of hope, the other is of caution. Uh, third is really messages to the stakeholders, and I'll touch upon what you said about the uh, digital economy and the uh, infrastructure needed. But the hope, I think, as, as we've just heard, uh, very young population in the MENA region, uh, with this comes lots of energy and talent, and that can be the fuel for the future. Uh, however, the word of caution here is that policies that worked in the last century or the beginning of this century are not applicable in the future. And I think we need to, uh, uh, the governments primarily need to focus on, on that aspect. So do we have the right policies and the regulations uh, needed? Third, the message I think to the stakeholders, different stakeholders, and primarily, uh, let me start with governments. Uh, in addition to uh, regulations, I think putting the digital economy on top of the agenda is becoming a necessary aspect. Uh, with, uh, you know, the, the focus of governments uh, uh, should be starting to, to focus on the infrastructure needed to uh, bring about the benefits of the, the, the digital economy. The digital economy for this region, and going back to the first point of hope, can allow the region and the countries in this region to leapfrog. They don't have to go back and, and do what, what other developed nations have. I think we have a, a, a chance to leapfrog by the fact that these new technologies will impact education, uh, they can impact uh, you know, uh, health, uh, farming, you name it, in, 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 in the sense of the efficiencies that uh, it brings. The second message to the stakeholders focuses on the private sector. And the private sector, I think, need to understand that the technology that we are experiencing now is changing everything. And if, unless you adapt, you may be just swept away. And therefore, the focus on really becoming digital enterprises, the focus on employees and making sure that you retrain your staff to cater for the, for the, for the new reality is something that uh, current enterprises need to focus on. The third is the startups that we've just talked about. It's, we had an amazing uh, day yesterday with hundreds of them, but we have thousands out there who will be forming the new uh, economy for this region? And I think it's uh, my message to them is keep at it, uh, go forward, and fight for the changes that we, we discussed yesterday. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a hard finish at 55. So can I just get a sense in the room of who has a question? Um, do we have microphones? We do, that's great. So can we just take the question there and the question in the middle? Hi. Can you just tell us where you're from and who you are? Thanks. Uh, Karen Laub from AP. I hate to go off topic, but I have to ask the German Defense Minister on the Iran election results. Rouhani won. Uh, he was uh, closely connected with the nuclear deal that is also very important to Germany. Can you briefly comment on that? Okay, and uh, question in the middle? <coughs> Um, hi, um, Frank Kane from Arab News and Jeddah. Uh, uh, this question is really for Mr. Biari. Um, I, I wonder uh, uh, what the alternative is to the Vision 2030 uh, plan that's underway in your country. Uh, if it doesn't succeed, what, what does Saudi do next? It's only, only got a few more years to run, I guess, Frank. Um, so a couple of questions there. Do we have a question that's actually on the topic from... Someone in the, yeah. Oh, okay. Three questions on topic. Yeah, go on. Steal, steal him. We can see if we've got time. It's it's for the uh, German defence minister on on the t uh, the t German troops in uh, in the Turkish base and whether there's going to be a move t to Jordan. Okay. So, minister, it looks like you're in the firing line for the questions. Yes. <laughs> Uh, 
so far I do not know the final results. Here you are, the final results of uh, the election in Iran, but um, it looks as if Rouhani uh, did win, which would be a positive sign and um, uh, would be positive for the nuclear deal too because it's necessary to, that all sides meet the requirements. What in Chilik and um, Jordan is concerned, First of all, it is important we have, uh, when we send uh, servicemen and servicewomen into missions, it's the parliament who sends the armed forces into missions. So um, for our parliament, it is very important to have access um, to uh, the, the missions and the troops and to be able to visit the troops. This is the first point. Um, now, in Inchalik, um, so far it was difficult for parliamentarians from the German parliament to visit the troops that are stationed there. It is a mission in counter Daesh. Um, I've been visiting here in Jordan the air base um, Al Azraq yesterday. Um, I was impressed. Uh, it is a uh, uh, th there's a lot of potential in this air base. Uh, we were very grateful for a very positive reception and a lot of uh, support. I will talk to the king later on this afternoon to thank him for uh, the, this, this gracious offer. Um, there is no political decision taken right now. This is important. Talks are still going on with Turkey, but in case that we will have to move, uh, we would be prepared knowing that um, this, this would mean uh, that we would have a gap uh, of a time gap in which our tornadoes or the refueling planes would not be able to take part in the missions. It's a matter of some weeks, um, but um, therefore now we have to plan in detail so that uh, operation would be possible as fast and as soon as uh, necessary. Having said that, I add against, uh, again that uh, political decisions haven't been taken yet. Can I, just bring you on? I, I just uh, wanted to second what uh, Minister von der Leyen said about uh, Iran and the Iranian elections. Uh, we very much uh, welcome uh, the re-election of uh, President uh, Rouhani. And I hope this can also send a message um, that uh, Iran will um, be serious about uh, reforms moving forward. And what we really uh, need in this region is a future rapprochement uh, between uh, Tehran and Riyadh. That could be a key uh, to um, address a lot of issues like Yemen, uh, Iraq, and etc. Thanks very much. And uh, I think we've got about one minute to go, which just leaves me time to say, uh, Khaled, uh, uh, Vision 2030, yes or no? <laughs> Well, a disclaimer, I'm a private citizen here. I don't represent the Saudi government, but as a, as a, as a Saudi citizen, I can tell you the, uh, the amount of positive energy that the National Transformation Program 2020 and the Vision 2030 have brought into the, the country is, is something that is, I've, I've never seen in my life. Uh, the government uh, is very determined in achieving uh, the KBIs and every uh, organization, every government organization is uh, very focused and works day and night on achieving the, these KBIs. So uh, the aspect of, uh, of the success, I think, is, is the only option for us as a nation. Thank you. Thanks to all our co-chairs and have a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you.